be a powerful and explosive study. So, as usual, call someone. God will not reject anyone. Jesus wants to make you a new person today. Good morning to our viewing and listening audience, all those who follow Whispering Hope, and those who have tuned in to follow our daily lesson plan. Today is Tuesday, our third installation of a Whispering Hope Early Morning Sabbath School Review. Today's lesson is the word of God's anger, the word of God's anger, and we are looking at the lesson this week that is captioned, a noble prince of peace, and from looking at the memory text, which says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And that is taken from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And we want to look at a passage today under our subheading before I get to uh, Elder Brad Dinoles. I want to look at the text for today, which is the word of God's anger, the word of God's anger. And we just want to read Isaiah chapter 9, verses 8 to verse 10. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 8 to verse 10. And you can just turn with us. You can follow us in your Bible. And so the text says, the Lord has sent a word against Jacob, and it will light upon Israel, and all the people will know, Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, who said, in pride and in arrogance of heart, the brick have fallen, but we build with dressed stones, and sycamores have been cut down, but we will put cedar in place. God seems to be exercising this word that he's speaking about in the lesson this week. And would you want to highlight or bring out the message for, this, for today's lesson? The word of God's anger. What is the word of God's anger, Elder Knowles? Let, let, me, let me look more at anger, right? Because God's anger is not punitive. God's anger is redemptive. Hear what the Bible says. Whom the Lord loves, he rebukes, and he chastens. Okay, so a, a rod plays a, 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 is a twofold role. It's the, the, the rod is a rod of correction, or it's a rod of authority. All right, and so God fulfills both roles. But, um, well, let, let me say this, though. If it's viewed in the context of the topic that we're looking at for this week, the Prince of Peace. Now, here, here's what is going on. So, so what God is seeking here is to find peace with his people. So uh, as I said, God's rod and God's anger is not punitive. It's about redemption. He wants to redeem his people. He wants to draw them close to him. So you would find that God is extremely patient as you, as you, as you view the story, He's extremely patient because the people are extremely wicked. And who would think that a God, any God would want to, you know, want to redeem people that are so awful, the kind of things that they would have been doing to their children and so on. How could God see these people as being salvageable, wanting to identify with these evil people and so on? Because so when I don't believe that we as um, humans would ever want to even associate with people like that. And so the, 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 the rod of God's anger actually, in my view, brings hope states verses 1 to 5 i read from 10 8 to 10 a while ago but verses 1 to 5 says but there will be no gloom for her that was in anguish in the former time he brought into contempt the land of zebulun and the land of naphtali but in the latter time he will make glorious the way of the sea the land beyond jordan galilee of the nations the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light to those who dwelt in the land of darkness, on them has light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nations, thou hast increased its joy. They rejoice before thee, as with joy the harvest, as men rejoice when divide, they divide the spoil for the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, 
thou hast broken as on the day of the Midian. For every root of the trampling warrior is but a tumult, and every garment rolled up in blood will be burned in the fuel of fire. Um, that's how it started. We, we read the, the main text of the day. But Christ, it seems to be looking, um, Elder, at this. Um, he's talking as if he's extending mercy. How could he be applying the rod? You know when our parents, when we did something naughty, what our parents did with us, they whipped our behind and said, you never do that again. And that's how we understand discipline and the rod and when you do something wrong, what the consequences. But Jesus seems to be taking a porch of mercy. Could you um, expound on that for our class this morning? Well, that's, uh, that's what... Um... That's what God specializes in, all right? Because here it is that um, Jesus said to his disciples that you must forgive 70 times seven. How could, how could God tell people they must forgive 70 times seven? And he is not doing the same thing. Because when you look at um, love, when you look at mercy, you look at peace, we look at justice and all the things. God is the epitome of all these things. He is the originator. He is the, he is the real deal. Okay? And so God, God's intent and purpose is never about destruction. His intent and purpose is about saving his children. Right? And so that's why, and so even though it sounds that it's coming over well, like people, God is angry, like the way that we're angry. It doesn't necessarily say me. God's anger is about the fact that people can't see how merciful and gracious he is. That's what angers him, right? And so he, he wants to, to make sure that we develop a kind of relationship with him, regardless of how far we'd have, we would have gone, because he can bring back anything, can salvage anybody, no matter how far they would have gone, right? So that's the kind of God that we serve. Yes, Elder, um, I looked at the lesson, and it says in the first section on the in your quarterly day if you just look at it, it says god's people suffering of god's people as shown in the above text that we were looking at we read those texts in um isaiah chapter 9 compared to leviticus 26 14 to 34 now no that's a long verse mm -hmm. and it says why did god punish his people in stages rather than all at once why did God choose to punish them in stages rather than all at once? <laughs> I mean, you, uh, you, you would beat your child for a whole week. Would you want to do that nonstop? No, I don't think you'd want to do that. But you right? know, sometimes uh, in, in, in legal terms, some people would say the, the judge threw the whole book at them. You know, everything that you were guilty of, he didn't say, let me charge him on one and reprimand him on the other. So, you know, so there's sometimes that early judge operate that way, but God chooses not to. Why would he? Right, because this is what I'm saying. So God has made us free moral agents. He gave us the right to choose. He can give us the right to choose and then infringe on it totally and completely. It doesn't make sense. Okay? And so God allows us to be free moral agents. Okay, so what, what happens when we go against his wishes, then there are times when he would intervene. He would show us where we, got, where we would have gone wrong and he'll wait and give us the opportunity to be able to turn. Wait for you to turn. And so he can administer everything at the same time because if God does that, then everybody gonna be wiped out. You will die. And so God is about, not, not only just about watching his people suffer. God is a God of mercy. God is a God of love. He wants the best for his children, no matter how evil they would have become. In fact, the Bible says in um, John, for God so loved the world with all his evil and everything that he gave his only son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So that's what God wants to do. He wants to draw us to him at all times, but he has to also give us the freedom to choose. Yes, I, I get the point. He wants to salvage something from humanity, even though it yeah. looks so bad. Like farmers would reap a crop and there's a lot of um, bad potatoes. But out of that, but 
he didn't just take up the bag of potatoes and just cast them to the dump heap. He said, I'm going to salvage something. There is something, must be something in this bag of potato that I can salvage. What sins were the people guilty of? What was so reprehensible? What was so bad? What were these people doing? And who were these people, Elder? There's, listen, there are endless amount of things which they did. Infringements. Social injustice, inclusive of bribery, theft, murder, exploitation, failing to help the vulnerable, breaching the treaty that they have with God, the breach the covenant they had with him, and so many deceptions. They were into idolatry. They chose to trust idols and not repenting and all these things. And despite all this, God still chose to identify with them and to give them chance upon chance upon chance to come back to him, to show them the way, allow them to suffer the consequence of their choice. And then while they suffer the consequence of their choices, the same God still turn around and say, I'm going to punish those who punish you while you were doing the wrong thing. Listen, God's ways are difficult to hear actually to understand. It's past final. How could anyone have so much mercy and be so kind and so full of peace and understanding and patience? Only the great God of heaven qualifies for that. The other two questions there were, who did they commit these sins against? And are these people Christians and um, elder? We, we don't want to narrow it down to one denomination, but were they people who were children of God? Um, who should know better that we're doing these things? Of course. In fact, not only were children of God, they were God's chosen. Those are the ones whom God chose. Those are the ones who bear the name of God. Those are the ones who said, listen, all that you say, that we will do. But yet still somehow they, they seem to have been influenced by the prosperity of people who are around them. Not, not recognizing that they weren't prospering because they left their God behind. Not understanding that how the others prosper weren't through righteous means. And they did anything. They did anything to make sure that they prosper. They didn't seem to understand that, you know, there was no power and so on in idols. They didn't seem to understand that God was not just restricted to the temple alone. That God would be with them. Emmanuel, God with you everywhere you go. He was not just limited. And so they wanted to follow the others around. When they go into one song, they walk with their idols to represent different things and so on. And so their God was with them. But God has promised them that he would be with them always in every single situation. And, and this is what I think they missed the point. They misunderstood. And so they turned their backs on their God. Uh, absolutely, Elder. When we look at this situation, are there any similarities? Because I like to bring the lesson real. And I'm... Um, are there any similarity between Israel of old and our people today? Are we that wicked? Are we still disregarding what God has instructed us and we know better? Well, um, yes, yes, there are, there, are, there are similarities, but not the same. I think they were seriously prayer. They have gone seriously far away from God. In fact, they didn't even have a form of godliness. You, you understand? That's how depraved that they actually were. They were their backs were completely turned. Anything that, that um, pertains to God, it, it seemed like um, something enemy to them. They didn't want to participate in anything that pertains to their God. But here it is, in, in our context, we can fall into something similar because, you know, idolatry is one of the easiest things that we can enter into, especially when it comes to personal gratification, Right? When I want to zero in on myself, when I want things to work out my way. Similarly, like those people in their time, we can fall prey to those same things. And so the, the, I, the whole thing is for us to be extremely careful, right? That we don't fall into the same trap, even though we're quietly going away and not as murderous and, and so on like they are. And then not stealing like they are, maybe not exploiting like they are. But because we're doing things, maybe doing things for the wrong reason it caused us to fall into the same trap like they fell into. But um, the lesson closed out with asking a very personal question. So I want to use myself as an example. It says, how has God used suffering in your life to turn you away from wrong, the wrong course of life? Well, I 
I, I know you, Elder uh, knows a young, a, a strapping man from since you were young, looking all so healthy and invincible. Uh, but I'm not the same. I grew up a frail young man, had a pre-existing condition where I had issues with blood clotting, um, where the blood clotting time is slower than much human beings. So I have to be careful not to get a cut. So um, that is what has caused the deterioration in my joints. Now, I, I said, when you look at it sometimes, I do not seem to, I do not choose to blame God and say, why did he put me in this situation? I look at it from a positive perspective and say, God must have seen I would have had a different mentality than my other siblings, Rose and Hudson's children. And, and he says, I want to humble this one because if I leave him with everything intact, the, like the others, he'll become arrogant, full of himself, or beside himself and would bring destruction upon his life. But humbling me in that way let, let, um, creates a vulnerability and allows me to rely on God who is able to sustain me. So I would say, um, I would look at my challenge and say, it has caused me to um, um, turn away from wrong. And that is not to say that I've not done wrong things in my life. Of course, because the Bible says all have sinned and fall short, you know, so um, yes, but this particular issue, I believe, has humbled me. And that is, I can testify, I'm sure that somebody out there now, don't become bitter because you're sick, because you're unable to buy all the things you want, you don't have the job like somebody else. Perhaps God is working with you in whatever your situation is that you're trying to blame God for to save you. Because the most important thing in our life is our salvation. Um, Elder knows what do you have to contribute in that regard? Okay, well, before I, if I give my contribution, let me say something though. Um, nobody looking at you with the sound of the voice that you have and how powerful it is could ever determine what you just said <laughs> a few moments ago. So count your blessings. <laughs> but you know, um, God is good. I'm not sure if I necessarily want to um, use the same, the same questions, use the same question, the way it is structured in the part today. But what I want to say though, is that um, there are many times with, uh, with, uh, that I would have tried to go on certain paths, which I you know, think would be beneficial for myself. And it seemed to me as though when I take, go one step forward, I'm going two steps backward. And sometimes it can become very, discouraging. But when I view the whole picture, when I understand who God actually is and God has a plan for my life, it changes my perspective, the way I reason, the way I think. And what, I, what, uh, what it has helped me to do is to help people who are in a similar situation, to be able to encourage them, to tell them you know, about the greater plan that God has for them. Even though things don't work in this, this life, there's a better life to come in which you'll be able to accomplish all the things you try to accomplish here and even more, so much better. There's, there, there's something much grander. And so if you were to look back in your life, you'd be able to see how much God has blessed you in different areas of your life. So you count your blessings. You don't even have to name them one by one. You can name them 10 by 10 because there's so many blessings, right? God has been good to us. And the fact that you've been able to hold a conversation with me is a blessing, especially in times like these. Because in America, over 400,000 people are under the ground because of COVID. You understand? And so... Our light afflictions, according to Paul, our light afflictions work for something greater. It's something better, right? That is coming. And so we, we have hope in God. We have hope in Christ that God will always work things out and God will see us through because we have placed our trust and our confidence in him. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I've come across many people, and that's why I took the time out to go through that particular point, who blame God for their situation rather than seeing the benefits of what God is trying to do for them and in their life with their situation. God has a reason for every situation. Um, why God anointed David King and had him running for many years, nobody knows, but there was a reason in that plan. Certainly, it made David a different person. And there are circumstances that are gonna be in your life, my friends who are viewing this morning. Look at it from a different perspective. That's why we're here this morning, because Jesus, has come as the deliverer to set the captives free. Don't imprison yourself anymore. Be free in Jesus Christ. Elder knows I'll give you the closing point this morning as we um, look into a new day 
uh, of work. But just before I go and do the closing remarks, I, I'm going to ask you to give your closing words to somebody who's there listening and may need a word. Okay, so we looked at the, the rod of God's anger. And just from the way it's been phrased, it sounds very dreadful. But if you get into the meat of what is going on, if you read from the beginning, it may seem hopeless. But as you continue to read into the book of Isaiah, you recognize what God is offering is actually hope. And God's anger is not actually punitive. It is redemptive. So God wants to bless all of us in a special way. So we pay attention to God through all the changing scenes of life. Let us trust God. Even when we can't see his hand working in our favor, he's still working for us. And that's the kind of God that we serve. So let us continue to bless the name and lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Well spoken, well spoken, um, Elder Nose. So we just want to thank you, your, our viewers, viewers who have logged in this morning to early morning um, Sabbath school with you. We're happy to have you. We want you to have a productive day as you go out. Share the link with a friend. This can probably change their life for the better. They may be struggling with something and we may have touched a salient point this morning that can be helped with them. May God continue to bless your ministry as you come from week to week. Uh, we'll see you every Tuesday. You'll see Elder Bradley every Tuesday. Tomorrow coming up will be Sister Cora Galway will be with us tomorrow, Wednesday morning, to look at another aspect of the lesson, root and branch in one. You can't afford to miss it. It's another intriguing study. You will be blessed. So by the time we get to Sabbath, you would have already known the lesson and you would have your questions ready to post to us based on what we would have discussed this week. May God bless you richly as you go on your way today.